Well, hi everyone. Thank you for joining me once again for another session in the kingdom. We are back again on part two of the series on praise and worship. We've already discussed the um, praise part of this process and now we're getting ready to step into part two, which is the worship part of praise and worship. And hopefully some of you have got some great insights as to the last session we taught on praise and worship. We're going to pick up part two of that. And after the series is finished, which is only a two-part session, I'm hoping to step into a new series of teaching on who were Jesus' disciples. That's going to be my next session. I'm doing research on that right now to find out. We're going to do a, a session on who was Jesus' disciple and where did he get them from and which school did they go to and how did they live and where did Jesus um, choose them from? What was their identity? Hey, Elliot, welcome aboard, my friend. We're going to do a teaching on that. And here's the key part. And if they went to no institution or college, how were they used of God considering they had no formal training? We're going to talk about that. And that's my next series of teaching after I finish up this one on worship. And so we look forward to stepping into that kingdom session. And that's going to be awesome. You're going to learn some things about where they came from, who they were. And if Jesus was not real, as some would have in their mind, um, then why would these men be willing to lay their life down? How did they die? We're going to talk about those process next series of teaching we're doing on who was Jesus' disciple? Where did he get them from? What was their background? Um... What was their profession? We're going to discuss those issues next year. This year. So I'm looking forward to them preparing the notes on that now. So next year we step into that realm. But thank you for once again for joining me. For those of you who joined me for the first time, thank you. Welcome aboard. We're in for a set part two of this series on praise and worship. We did praise last week and I gave you the seven to ten words on praise. And now we're going to incorporate into the praise is worship. And this second part is very fascinating, intense. You're going to learn some things and learn some meaning of words. And for those of you who join me for the first time, thank you for coming on board. If you've never sat in one of my sessions, you're more than welcome to go to Facebook or YouTube or Google Spotify. And there you will find all my teaching on the kingdom. Uh, uh oh. Hopefully, Elliot uh, is on board. Let me pause for a second. Oh, my wife is on. Okay, we're still good. All right, just want to make sure. Hi, honey. Welcome on board. And so we're going to take a part two on worship tonight. And we'll see how far I can get in this one. I'm hoping just making a part two and say part three, if it's all possible, since we did praise last week and we got done a good, decent time. I'm going to try to do the same thing again tonight, okay? So we're on again for worship. I'm going to hit the road running. Got a lot of material to cover. Let's see how far we can get tonight. And get your notebooks ready. Get your mind ready because I'm going to challenge you to think and to reason things out. And as you start to get understanding, you start to be able to put into practice what you're hearing in the session on the kingdom of God. All right, we're going to pick up the section on what does worship mean, right? Simple statement. I think most of us can understand it or can be pretty much can define it, what it means for them. But what does the worship really mean? Well, from the Webster Dictionary, the word worship means the feeling or expression of reverence or adoration for a deity, to revere, to reverence, to venerate, pay homage to, to honor, to adore. Another word he uses to praise, pray to, Glorify, exalt, extol, hold dear, cherish, treasure, esteem, adulate, idolize, deify, hero worship, some words, lionize, uh, follow, look up to. And in the informal sense, uh, to put on the pedestal, to formal laud or archaic to magnify. Those are some words. Hey, babe, welcome aboard. Good having you. Hi, Elia. It's to to recognize the word worship has these different words attached to the word worship. But I want to take the word worship and define that in a different form. But I wanted to give you the Webster Dictionary, the forms that they use in defining the word worship. It's a feeling or expression of reverence, adoration for a deity is what they use. In other words, they use there, are the words is the revere, reverence, venerate, pay homage to, honor, adore, praise, pray to, glorify it. Exalt and extol. That's certain words that is used in the word worship. But I want to define, take the word even further. I want to take the word worship and break it down for you. Well, there's two words attached to the word worship. It's the word word ship and worth ship. Hmm. 
The word ship there is not a boat. <laughs> I know most of you say the word worship. Well, we're going to boat. No, 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 no. You need to understand. You're going to learn some things about worship tonight. It's the word, two words attached to the word worship is word ship and worth, W O R T H, ship. And the word ship, I said, is not a boat. So I will define that for you. Let's start with the word word, word, word ship. Well, the word word there is the expression of thought in words because of the position, character, and attribute of God. That's the word wordship. Okay. Now we have to look at the word worth. The worship we're giving God has to have worth attached to it. So the word worth here means excellence of character or quality as commanding esteem, condition of being worthy, honor, renowned, or God is worthy is what we'll say. Right? In our worship, God is worthy. So the word worth there has an excellence of character, quality as command and esteem, condition of being worthy, honor, renown, our God is worthy. Now let's look up the word ship. So I gave you the word word, and I gave you the word worth. Now look up the word ship. The word ship there is not a boat. It is a native English suffix of nouns denoting condition. Right? Condition or character office, or skill. And it also, it continues to indicate uh, rank, office, or position. The word lordship comes into play now. Word forming element meaning quality, condition, act, power, skill, office, position, or relations between. Right? That's the word worship. So here's what he's trying to tell you. So we're going to worship God... We now have to recognize, we have to ex uh, recognize the value or the worth or the words that we're speaking that's in truth to the ship or the one who's in the office position or skill or power that we're giving these words to. Praise is words. Praise is an expression. Worship now comes out of that because now out of praise, which is expression of hands, we said last week, we talked about a different style in worship, whether it's yada, toda, remember that last week, shabak, where we shout out, barak, where we kneel, other one we prostrate ourselves. Now, out of that now, worship takes you to more the inner man, and out of the inner man is expressed in a physical form called praise. Ah, mm, wow. So when you give God worship, you're going to make sure, and he's going to tell you very clearly. Let me give you the scripture so you can see it for yourself. He says something in John chapter 4. I want to show that to you, that what God is looking for. So when you look at worship, and I'm going to say something here also that's going to shock some of you, is that many of our worship we give God, it's in John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. I want to show you what God's looking for. Because most of us worship God, praise God, but we never ask God what does he look for. What's he calling worship and praise? Listen to John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Listen to this. But a time is coming and has now come when the true worshiper, the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father, listen to this, this is what the Father seeks for. The Father seeks such as these to worship him. Then who's he seeking? Who's them? He seeks such as these to worship him. Right? What's he looking for? They that worship in the spirit and truth. Now God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Mm. Wow. So we sometimes get caught up in the explanation, the, the outer things. But he said, what I really want is truth on the inside in spirit. But most don't know how to worship God in spirit because they don't know what the definition of walking in spirit means. Let me show you what walking in spirit means so you understand what the Father's looking for. When you give God words in worship, your words must be true, not based on what you're told, but based on your experience. So when you say God is great, you must have an experience in your life that you've been through with God that proved to you God is great. So if you use the words, not based on what you're told, it's based on your own experience. And that's called truth. Mm. Remember I said to you, nothing is yours in the Bible until you personally discover it for yourself. So the Bible said you shall know the truth. Know, the, know there doesn't mean head knowledge. Know there means experience it for yourself. Because it becomes your personal testimony. So now, if you understand walking in spirit and truth, your words must be truth. Now, how do you walk in the spirit? 
Well, here's how you walk in the spirit. You have to follow Jesus' example. Capture the thought and imagination of the mind and cast them down. Make the right choice of the heart and obey God. Choose to obey God and to disobey Him. And don't manifest sin in flesh. That's called walking in the spirit. So now you now know about capture thought. Make the right choice of the heart. Don't manifest sin in flesh. You're called walking in the spirit. Now you add truth to that, which is the words you're speaking come from a true place because you're walking right before God. So when you give God word, make sure your word is true. Now, many times we're singing songs in church, it's based on a choir director or somebody leading worship that has picked up songs that they like to sing that may give them goosebumps or it's a moan that moves their heart, if you wish. But many times we never ask God, what does God call worship? We just basically go and they say, God, I'm going to pick the song, this song, three fast, two slow, and we're going to be happy with that. But here's what he says. He says, now, God is spirit. And then that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So we got to understand what we call worship. God's looking for something to all the opposite. We're giving oblation of praise, which is nothing wrong with that. Because if it comes from a place of truth or your own experience, God accepts that as praise. Giving thanks. I'm going to show you scriptures that prove to you we have to shout it out, lift our hands to hold on yard. But it must come from a foundation of truth and from the spirit. That's what God desires. Ah, wow. So now once you know how to walk in the spirit... And your words is now truth. Those are what God call worship. <laughs> so that's why they that worship in spirit truth. That's what the Father seeks after. God is spirit. And your worship must come from the spirit. Not from your mind. Not from your emotion. Now our emotion is affected by our experience with God. And thus many times we may cry. We may laugh. We may lift hands. God doesn't have a problem with that. Because we are... People and creatures that need to express themselves from words to action, right? So he doesn't mind that. But many times, it's sad part to say, in a group setting where there's a multitude of people and the band is playing, we can get caught up in offering God hand sign and empty words that has no meaning, that doesn't touch the heart of God because it's not in spirit and in truth. And we can actually hide out in a praise and worship situation and never touch the heart and mind of God. Interesting, huh? Why? Because it's a form of a show, a form of godliness, but there's no power. Because many times our minds and our heart is not right. Remember now the three places God look at? Mind, heart, flesh, right? So if we are saying words coming from not a place of truth, but a place of maybe an emotion or some kind of damage, or a place of fear, and we're saying, God, I love you, and perfect love has a fear, but we don't believe it, then our worship is in vain because we're saying word we really don't believe. And he said that worship must be worship in spirit and in truth. Truth means that which is backed up by facts or evidence. So your truth to speak must be supported scripturally and must be backed up by facts or your personal testimony or evidence you've experienced with God. Get it? Oh, all right. So we now understand the word worship, worth-ship. So you're giving honor to the one who's worth it and word-ship. And the position to the office. There are certain words we want to look at when looking at the word worship. We want to look at the word revere. The word revere feels a feel deep. A, a word revere in the word worship is to feel deep respect or admiration for. So in your worship, there's a feeling of deep respect or admiration for. Another word that's used in the word worship is the word adoration. You've heard this before. And adoration has to do with deep love and respect for the one that you are adoring. Another word that's used in worship is the word honor. Honor here represents high respect or esteem to the position, office, or the ranking, lordship. Thus, the word lordship comes into play. And there's another word that's used here in the, in the word worship is the word praise. Now, we now understand the definition of the Hebrew last week. We talked about that. But praise means express warm approval or admiration of. And praise, like I said before, is more outwardly in praise and shouting prostering one said, kneeling down the whole nine yard. Okay? Now, there's another word that's used called glorify. Right? We said, in worship, we glorify your name. We sing the song, glorify thy name. Right? So here's the word glorify. The Hebrew word here for glorify is including the word hod, H-O-D, or kavod, K-A-B-O-D. And in the New Testament, it is used to translate the Greek word doxa. I'm going to define this word for you. Doxa. In the Greek, in the Hebrew, it's kavod or had. That's the word in the Hebrew. And the Hebrew word kavod here originally means weight or heaviness. Weight or heaviness. Doxa 
in the Greek originally means judgment or opinion, and by extension, a good reputation or honor. So in glorifying God, the person that you're glorifying, there is a heaviness to it. There is a judgment or opinion that by extension, the person's reputation and his position is worthy of honor. Mm. Wow. So if you understand the process of glory and glorifying thy name, that's the key. Give me one scripture. 1 Chronicles 16, 23 through 31 is talking about praise and worship. 1 Chronicle 16, 23 through 31. Sing to the Lord. We now know that's praise, right? Because it's outwards, it's voice, it's vocalizing. Sing to the Lord. So it's a command of scripture. All the earth, sing to the Lord. Well, is God more concerned about our snap, crackle, and pop like in the choir? <laughs> or is he asking us to sing because singing come from the place of rejoicing or joy in the heart that's expressed through the mouth called singing. So he commands in 1 Chronicles 23, sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim. Proclaim has to do with announce his salvation day after day in your life. So a part of worship has to do with thanking God for what he's done in your life. Verse 24, declare, declare, the word declare there, his glory amongst the nation. Express what God has done in you so your words is speaking, your voice is speaking. His marvelous deeds among all the peoples, right? For great, for great, by the way, these words I'm talking to you, I'm going to mention to you, I'm going to define the word. The word sing here may, means, the word sing here means make musical sound with the voice, especially words with a set tune. Thus in singing, Instrument is also incorporated in your singing to the Lord. The word proclaim means they declare officially or publicly to be. Announce officially or publicly. That's the word for proclaiming publicly. Right? Declare now means to make known or state clearly, especially in explicit or formal term. So when you declare something, you make it known state Stately clear, especially explicit and informal terminology. That's the word to proclaim. And the words are the word to declare. Now, he says in declaring, and he said, his marvelous deeds. What has God done? His action, right? So this here is an action that is performed intentionally or consciously. So he asks us in praise to declare his marvelous deeds amongst the people. For great, great here means, is the Lord. The only idea is that great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Okay, we'll get back to that. So the word here, great, means of an extent, amount, or intensely, considerably above the normal or average. So God is great. He's above the normal or average because he is great. And he says he's greatly to be feared. Fear here doesn't mean be scared of him but to have a reverential awe of God, a respect, a sense of, the word, the word awe there, when you really look at it, meaning that there's no word to express it, so the only word you have is awe. And awe means it's being, almost like being mesmerized, you don't know what to say, you're almost in a place of respect and honor, but just beyond amazement, that's the word I could use for awe. Be in awe of God because there's no word to express what you're seeing, what you hear, what you know, what God is, who God is. So the only word is in, you're just in awe of Him. And there's no word you can use beyond that point. That's the highest esteem word. So the Bible tells you to be in awe of Him. So He goes on to tell us. He says, verse 26, for all the gods, I'm sorry, He says, for great is the Lord and most worthy be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. That means if they would word plural, gods, that there are gods in our world. But there's only one true God. So there are all the gods here, and people worship him. This is what he says next. Splendor and majesty are before him. S strength and joy, strength and joy are in his dwelling, in his dwelling place. Some of these words I define intentionally in different ways. So when I go back and look at them, to look at these words, we can look at the word splendor, we can look at the word majesty, so you can understand what they are. When God asks us to worship in splendor. The word splendor here means great brightness, brilliant light, or luster. That's the declaration of God. And in majesty, the word majesty, the interesting word majesty. Um, you should worship in splendor and in majesty. Well, majesty here means impressive stateliness, 
dignity, beauty, or royal power. Mm. Now, this is talking about God here. All right? So, if God is religious, if God's a president, God's a governor, God's a mayor or anything like that, or a senator, then why are they talking about majesty? Well, majesty only go to one form of leadership or rulership we know. It's called kingly rulership, right? So we now know by this statement that God is a king. So if you have to worship in splendor, in great brightness, brilliantness, and luster, and in majesty, impressive stateliness, dignity, beauty, and royal power, then it has nothing to do with democracy. It has to do with a rulership of a king and a kingdom. Huh. All throughout the Bible, it tries to show us the Bible is about a king, kingdom, and his royal family. And we keep trying to make God into a religious God. And he is not. He is a king. Thus, everything that is ascribed to the king is in honor or in worship or in bowing down or prostrate before a king to give them the honor that is due him. Get it? Ooh, boy. Wow. So it says, ascribe. The word ascribe here means to give credit to the Lord. That's the word described. All you families of nations, so everyone should give honor, a credit to God. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. <laughs> See the word there? In spirit and in truth. Holy being called out separate. Verse 30. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say amongst the nation, the Lord reigns. Now we now know there's only one individual on the planet that reigns for a lifetime, and that's a king or queen. Hmm. The Lord reigns. Lordship means the owner and the master reigns. Well, it doesn't even become rolled in for four years. Or eight years, he's not voting into power. He's born into power. He's born by birthright. So he reigns. A king reigns. Presidents get voted in. Governors get voted in for a set period of time. But king reigns for a lifetime. They're born into power and they reign. So God is a king. Woohoo! Wow. We talked about splendor. We talked about magic. We talked about strength. Strength here, by the way, he worshiped in, in splendor and in and before him in strength and in joy. Very interesting word he used there. In strength. That's where the same word that falls in the word grace. Power, enablement, and strength. Strength means power, force, energy. Might mean the ability to exert, exert, exert effort. Power implies latent or exerted physical, mental, or spiritual ability to act or to be acted upon. Hmm. That's the same word grace. That's the strength that's involved. So what God gave us in the New Testament, by grace you have been saved. And that none of yourself it is a gift of God, none of works, lest any man should boast. So grace saved you, but mercy keeps you. What did you use to save you? Power, enablement, and strength. Now what was these three, three things necessary? Because you had a God of this world called Satan, who had you in his grasp, and in order to defeat him, he had to use those three things to defeat him and take the authority back to give it back to you. Power, enablement, and strength. So grace saves you, but mercy keeps you. Ah, wow. So when you see the word strength in the name of God, God is strength. God is the ultimate strength. And he's the majesty. The word majesty, impressive, stateliness, dignity, beauty, royal power. We did that one already. But the idea, that if you understand that this majesty have all this force, strength is power, force, energy, strength. Might need the ability to exert, an, ex exert effort. Power may imply latent or exerted physical, mental, or spiritual ability to act. When you're tempted, that's why grace is given to you. Grace was given to you and I not to break God's law, but to keep them. Because why? In the moment of our weakest times in our life, and you're being tempted, what you need from God and the misunderstanding that we've been taught is that grace means I can do what I want to do and just God's going to look lightly upon and he's going to forgive me for it. That grace has been misinterpreted, misused, and grace has become disgrace. Because we're using grace as justification for sin. No matter what I do, grace covers me. No, 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 no. You misunderstood the word grace. It is mercy that covers you. It is grace that God gave you to overcome your temptation and your weakness 
And grace, grace gives you the power, enablement, and strength to overcome your temptations. You can walk right before God. Grace was given to you to give you the power to overcome, not to use it as I mean when you sin. And you don't get grace when you sin. You get mercy. You do not get grace. Grace was given to you to keep the law, not to break the law. Thus the misconception, because in the word grace is the power, enablement, and strength. You're made like God. And that's what the Jesus came to fulfill. Old Testament time and the children of Israel was to show them that in and of themselves, by self-effort or by them trying, they couldn't keep not even one of God's law. New Testaments were all about God coming to give us a new covenant to fix that problem. What was the solution? To take the laws of the stone tablet, write them in our heart, come and dwell within us by the power of the Holy Spirit, gave us the power, enablement, and strength now to keep the law which the Old Testament time Jewish people could not keep you and I now have the capacity through the power of the Holy Spirit to keep and obey God's law so he fulfilled that thing and make it a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Jacob oh wow deeper than I want to go but I want to show you this is all still part of worship so you understand the word and you understand what the word means very important in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2 through 6, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. When God gave a commandment that you shall have no God, that means there's other gods here. He would not give that command if there was none other gods here. So there is such a thing as lower G gods. There are many gods in our world. Men make up their own God. But there's only one ultimate most high God. And he's the God of gods. <laughs> wow. So when somebody says, I believe in God, I love what my wife said, it is our responsibility as believers to ask them, which God are you talking about? Because there's many gods that people are worshiping. For all you know, the God they say they believe in could be the telephone or the cell phone. Could be God Thor or um, you name the different gods of our world that they're naming. It could be Muslim, Buddhism, for all this type of gods that they have. So you must define the meaning of the God and ask them, what God are you talking about? If they said the most high, the great I am that I am, then you talk about the most high. Because there are many gods. By the way, if you look at the word, um, I'm trying to think of a word. I think the word is Elohim. There's four types of Elohim. Elohim means God, right? The most high is the most high Elohim. That's God himself. But also the angel of Elohim. Lucifer is Elohim, and you're Elohim. Hmm. Interesting terminology. Well, the word Elohim means God. But the G God, he says, Jesus said, have you not read what I said, you are gods? So you yourself are Elohim because you're made in God's image. Thus, there are many Elohims. So Lucifer is Elohim as well, but he's a lower G. Angels are Elohim because they're made in God's image. They're also gods. So there are many gods in our world. So when you read the scripture, he says, you shall have none of the gods before me, it's because the people had formed their own gods. And so you can't have one before me. I am the most high, the only, most important. Thus, the first and greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then second, like unto it, love the neighbor as you love yourself. The first commandment is to love God, the Most High. He doesn't take second place to any gods. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself any images in the form of anything in heaven above, oh boy, in heaven above, or on earth beneath, or the waters below. So when we have pictures of Jesus in church, I'm sorry, that's an image. Another one here, some of you got Jesus in his blonde hair, blue, I'm sorry, they ain't Jesus, sorry, hate to mess up your theology. Some have Jesus with black afro, he ain't him either, sorry. Make no image. <laughs> Lord Jesus, help us. You shall not make for yourself, any more words to make, that means your hands design it, someone has painted it, and that's the whole idea of making. Someone has crafted it, and put the picture and the face on it, and then we bow down to worship that which is not a God at all, but it's an image in the form of anything in heaven. That means sun, moon, and stars, that's in heaven. When you talk about heaven here, by the way, he's not talking about the heavens of heaven where he dwells. He's talking about the sky above. We have people who make, make gods of the sun, moon, and star. Do not make those images. Remember now, when he gave this law, they could not see as far as the eye could see. So he could not be talking about the heaven, the, the dwelling place, and the abode of God. He had to talk about the heavens above the earth, where they could see with their eye. Thus, most of your historical documents, when you look at them, you should have a design of some star, sun, moon, or some creature designed within the star in heavens. Thus, in the Greek mythology, when a 
quote unquote, hero died, he became stars in the sky in form of a donkey. Some of you looking at the great big dipper. <laughs> I'm just saying. These are images, folks. That's why he said don't do that. But we're doing it anyway. So he tells very clearly. He said, neither of heaven nor the earth beneath, because we understood we are on the earth so we can make images of trees, sun, animal, plants, all down there, and the waters below, fish, leviathan, all the stuff we make the image of. He said, don't do it. You shall not bow down to them or worship him. Do not bow to them or worship him because if you made it with your own hand, they, they're not greater than you, you are greater than them. So why would you bow down to them when your own hand designed them? For I, very important word, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. What? God is jealous? Yes, he did. See, let me tell you something. When you exalt anything above me, your family, friends, mother, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, I did that teaching. Remember? I said, if you honor them more than you love them more than me, you ain't worthy. So because I'm a jealous God. Why? Because no one should have the same position, worthiness, splendor, majesty, strength that I have. Because I am the one and only true God. Ah. So I said, I do not want you to put anything above me because I'm a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation. Wow. In other words, punishing the children has to do with the failure of the parents, but it is passed on through through training or repetition of the children. And because they are programmed by their parents, the, the error of the parents passed on to the children, and thus they're being punished, the sins of the parents, to the third and fourth generation of children. Why? Repetitive pattern. Being taught a certain way that they copy, and now they're paying the price because they can't break the pattern. And thus they're being punished because of something the parents taught them in error. And thus the curse continues on to the fourth and third generation. If we, in our day, mom and dad became alcoholic, teach that to the one generation, guess what he's going to do? He'll continue the process of drinking until he become alcoholic. He'll then pass it on to his son because, remember now, he's a, he's a pattern that his child is watching and thus this go on to the third and fourth generation. Why? The next generation he'll have, the son will copy or daughter will copy them. The next generation will have the next one. That's what's going on here. So he says, very clearly, He's a jealous God, punishing the children of the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Verse 6, but showing love to a thousand generation of those who love me and keep my commandment. I keep saying over and over again, the measure of your love before God is not the words we give him, it's the obedience that we show him. So God is always through scripture very consistent, attributed love to obedience. And thus if you walk obediently, he promises you, he showed the love to a thousand generation. That means when you walk right, he'll bless your children, children, children up to a thousand generation. Just as the first generation that passed on sin of the parents to the third and fourth, if they passed on righteousness, they are blessed to a thousand generation. Do you understand? Oh, wow. That's what he's trying to tell us. John 4. 21 through 24. John 4, 21 through 24. The woman, the Samaritan woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritan worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Jews speaking there. For salvation is of the Jews. Hear the word? Salvation comes from the Jews. And it's for the Jews. Yet, verse 23, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshiper the true worshiper will, not if, not maybe, will worship the Father in spirit. Well, how do you worship in spirit? In your obedience. That's called worship. Not what you say per se, even though we use words to express ourselves, but in worship. Because why? God's looking at the mind and the heart. So when you're in spirit, he looks at the mind and the heart continuously. Are you seeing it? They will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Inside, the great thing we do is called discernment, right? What are you looking for in discerning yourself? So we try to discern situations, we try to discern problem, try to discern what's going on with me. But the greatest discernment you have to have is discernment of yourself. Are you able to discern what's in your mind, in your heart? When somebody make an accusation from the outside, like saying you are a bigot, you're whatever it might be, and that's their words coming at you based on some action they may have seen you do or a misunderstanding, and they're going to try to put that labeling on you. But if you're able to discern your own mind and your own heart, then they can't put that label on that you're a bigot. Because why? There's no animosity in your mind and heart towards the individual. They're saying that because that's their assumption, but it's not making it true. Ah. My wife said also, we worship also with how we manage what he gives us. Amen. 
That's a part of our convenience, right? It's the obedience commandment. So if we learn to be good stewards of what he gives us, yes, that's called love. It's obedience again. Exactly right. That's called worship. So many times we think it's in singing and song and those things are important, but more so is in our ability to rule over things that God gives us to manage it and to obey the right laws pertaining to how to be successful in what he gives us stewardship over. So he says over and over again, he can tell, tell us, um, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me, mean obey me, the word love is obey me, and they keep my commandments. They don't try to break it. So he promised you a thousand generations of righteousness. Ah, wow. So he said, now the worship he's looking for, we worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seek. The kind of the worshipers the Father seeks after. So everybody's worshiping, but why does the Father seek after this kind? Interesting, huh? So that tell me, if people ain't worshiping spirit and truth, are they really worship, and are they one the Father's looking for? Ah, interesting. Very quite interesting question to, to ponder. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father is seeking after. Hmm. So God is seeking something, and he wants something, but he wants the one to worship spirit truth. He said, now, the reason why he's doing this, because God is spirit, he's not flesh and blood. And his worshiper must worship it in spirit, that's where he gets the glory, and in truth. And I explained to you what the truth means. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. I broke down to you how to work in spirit, or how to worship God in spirit. Psalms 99. Continue on with the concept of worship. The Lord reigns. There's another word. The Lord reigns. Let the nation tremble. He sits enthroned. Very interesting word. As you read the book of Psalms, please be careful and make sure you look at these words as you're going through them. The Lord, it's lordship. It comes from kingdom terminology. He reigns. That means he's a ruler, king, right? Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned, enthroned, encircled, or sits up on the throne between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. This is Psalm 99, by the way. He's exalted over all the nation. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Interesting terminology. God, let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. He is, the word holy there means called out and separated. Or in other words, used for holy there, he is one. What he says, what he does, and who he is does not change. That's why he's holy. What he says, what he does, and who he is does not change. Verse 4. The king is mighty. <laughs> Again, speaking of God. He loves justice. Mm. He wants law-abiding citizens. That's why he's the king of justice. He meet out justice. Not injustice. Justice for those who have been abused or hurt or injured. He meet out justice. So they are fairly compensated. You have established equity. Another word for equity is balance. In Jacob, you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were amongst his priests. Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them from the pillar of clouds. They kept his statutes. Statutes, the kingdom terminology again, which is law, and his decrees. When he speaks a word, his word becomes a decree or a law. His, law, his statutes are the law pertaining to governance of his kingdom. Um, he, so we now see they kept his statutes and his decree. He gave them. Verse 8. Lord our God, you answered them. You were, you were to Israel a forgiving God, though you punished their misdeeds. See, as a father there, right? When they break the rules, you have a responsibility to punish their misdeeds. Because why? It's a rod of correction, not a rod of judgment. Thus, God disciplines the ones he loves. Because why? He wants to bring you back to righteousness and obedience again. Because your blessing lies within the confine of the laws and provision he provides for you. Anything outside that risks death and dying. And thus, when you violate his law, he will punish the misdeed. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. Worship for our Lord, for the Lord our God is holy. Keeps repeating itself. God is holy. Wow. 
And I said before, we worship God by our obedience. And as my wife says, in managing, managing over what he gives us to rule over. So your obedience is called worship to God. Ah, question, question to, to disturb your pure mind. How did Jesus worship God? Aha! How did Jesus worship his father? Now, that being asked, I want you to use your pure mind to think. Did you ever see him in the temple or the synagogue worshiping the father? Now, we now know he went to the temple. We now know at 12 years old, he read from the book of Isaiah. We now know that he was a regular Jewish boy, grew up in a Jewish home. So the things he had to do. But what he called worship was totally different. We, we call worship today. Now, throughout the, the four Gospels, you don't find Jesus anywhere lifting up the God in worship. What he did demonstrate for you and me was his obedience in everything the Father gave him to do. And to be exact, he did it so well. The Bible says he was growing up. He grew up in wisdom and knowledge in favor with God and with man, right? He was, he was not trained in letters. And the Pharisees were shocked in the book of Acts. How does this young man know letters since he has not been trained? They were shocked at that. So he's growing faith with the Holy Spirit and with man. So we now know he didn't go around worshiping the Father where the Jews and the Pharisees were doing it. His obedience was worship to his Father. Thus the Father was the one when he was baptized by John the Baptist who came down and said, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him, the Son in whom I love. So many times you didn't find Jesus walking around telling the Father he loved them because the Father knew he loved them by his obedience. You get it? Oh, my, 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 my. That's some stuff. Someone need to hear that. Now, I'm going to look at worship again. I'm going to look at that. I just gave you the first portion. Let's look at worship again. Except I'm going to look at it through to where uh, an author I like to study when it comes to Hebrew words. His name is John Brenner. B Benner, B-N-N-E-R. I like his um, studies on Hebrew. So I'm always used looking up the word. And I gave you the definition before in John Brenner Webster Dictionary. Give you the definition, definition of worship. In the Hebrew is the word Shah-Ha. S-H-A-H-A-H. -A -H -A -H, Shah-Ha. That's the word for worship in Hebrew. And so as when we read the Bible, we must define our words. Remember I keep saying all of everything over and over again. Everything you read, if you're going to get revelation or understanding, you must define the meaning of the words. So this gentleman says the same thing. When we read the Bible, you must define your words from a Hebraic perspective. Why? Because the word was written to them. Remember, salvation is of the Jew. That means the law was given to them. So if you're going to understand the concept of your Bible, you must understand their mindset when they start to write from there. So in Hebrew, you must learn it from a, define the word from a Hebraic perspective and not from an English one. I love my wife said all the time. Because the English terminology we use are so much lesser than the original meaning of the words when they used it. They had a deeper understanding. It was written to them. Their concept was different than ours. And, and, and in my mind, the English translation is so much weaker than the original intent of the Hebrew meaning. Unfortunately, when we see the word worship in the Bible, we automatically assume the above definition of being a reverent love and devotion according, according to a deity, an idol, or a sacred object. The ceremony prayer of a religious form by which this love is expressed, right? We usually get that definition. That's what they, Miriam Webster Dictionary defines worship as. And that's what we get when we read it automatically. Assume that definition, causing a misinterpretation of biblical texts. If I ask the average believer, it is only, is it okay to worship a man? The answer would absolutely, would come back, absolutely not. We are only to worship God. Now, that statement we made is going to set my proof to you that worship can go to man as well as God. And you're not doing anything wrong. Because in our misconception, it's to a deity, right? But never to a man. But you're going to find throughout the Bible, many had worshipped kings. We'll get to them in a minute. So we say absolutely not. Only God is worthy of worship, really. But do you know there's a place in the Bible because we have a misconception of worshipping of a king by honoring them? It's the same as worship. We just don't say it that way. Let me give some scriptures, right? Back it up. Mm. Below are a few verses that, that are used to support the word worship. Genesis 24, 26. And the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. 
And the man bowed on his head and worshipped the Lord. 1 Samuel 15, 31. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Right? Psalm 29, 2. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in beauty and holiness. I think I read that earlier as well. The first question we must ask is this. What is the Hebrew word behind the English word worship? And what does it mean? I've got to answer the question. In each of the verse above, the Hebrew word behind the English word is worship. Right? This Hebrew word appears 172 times in biblical text, but it's only translated as worship 99 times in the King James Version. Now, below, I'm going to give the scripture or some translation of the same Hebrew word. Genesis 27, 29, let people serve thee and nation bow down to thee. In this passage, all other nation will bow down to the descendants of Jacob. That's worship. Mm. Give me another one. Exodus eighteen seven. And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance. The word was obeisance and kissed him. And and they asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. In this passage, Moses bowed down to his father-in-law. Hmm. Interesting. I thought we shouldn't worship God. They here they're doing exactly the same worship to a man. Hmm. In 1 Kings 1, 53, So King Solomon sent, and they brought Adonijah down from the altar. And he came and bowed himself to King Solomon. And Solomon said unto him, Go to thine house. In this passage, Adonijah, Adonijah was found righteous when he bowed down to Solomon. Mm. So when we look at this word, if we use the English translation, it appears we can only worship God. Yet we see here, they're giving homage to kings. These are high-ranking officials or another man. So worship goes both ways between God and with man. When the Hebrew word of, the word I gave you originally, shin, or shah, right, is used as an action towards God, the translators translate the word as worship. It's, and I remember to give you the, give you the word again. Um, it's S H A S H A H H A H Sha, right? So when it is used in that, the translator didn't know what to do, so here's what they did. When the Hebrew word Sha is used as an action word towards God, the translators translate the word as worship. However, when this same Hebrew word is used as an action towards another man, the translator translate the word as obeisance. Or obeisance, right? In other words, bow or to bow down. As you can see, the translator are preventing the reader from viewing the text in a proper Hebrew context. The concept, concept of worship is defined by Webster Dictionary is not Hebraic in any way and is not found in the Bible. <laughs> so I constantly, again, we got to see the Hebrew concept. It's not biblical. While there's nothing wrong with worship, in the sense that we normally understand this word, we should recognize that it is not a biblical concept. If the Hebraic meaning of worship is to bow down before another, whether God or a man, as we have seen from the text, then the answer to our question above is yes. It is acceptable to worship other men. Oh! While this sentence may sound blasphemous to those who are religious, due to our doctrinal view, our teaching of worship, we can do one, one of two things. We can remove the word worship from our vocabulary and replace it with bow down, or we can use the word worship, but recognize that it does not mean that what we have always assumed it to mean, to worship only God. So the Hebrew concept understood. They had to bow down before leaders, rulers, and kings. We say only God's worthy of it. So our concept is messed up based on translation. So our English translation doesn't measure up to the Hebraic translation of the word worship. Mm. So if we understand it properly, it goes both ways. We can worship God and man. But not in the context of a scene as a deity, but as an honor or bowing down to God and to man because of their position, ranking, or office. Wow. I therefore, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Oh, hold on. Hold on. What? Can we say that again? 
I thought worship was singing. I thought worship was just bringing hand. But hold up. He just said something to deliver there. I thought, oh, I praise you, Lord. Thank you. I prostrate myself. I bow down. I sing songs. That's praise and worship, right? I give you words. But now, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, not grace. Huh. Interesting word to use here. Not grace. In the view of God's grace, which we say, pardon because we say grace means unmerited favor and blessing. Hmm. Unmerited favor and blessing when I sin? No. In view of God's mercy, because grace is not renewed. Mercy is renewed every morning. To offer your bodies now, oh, the temple, your house, dwelling place of God, offer your body as a living, living, functional, moving, movement, motion, that's the word living, sacrifice. Hmm. Holy. Called out. Separated. Hmm. Set apart is the word holy. Pleasing to God. So he's saying to you and I, worship, and it's proper worship, in your bodies, you have to set yourself aside and your body apart, and you operate in wholeness, and make sure you're pleasing God, that's obedient. This is your true, true, and proper worship. How you live within your body, what you allow in your mind and your heart, making the right choices by honoring God, right? He said, you can worship God in your body. Ah, wow. Ah, let me read it again. Therefore, I urge you, this is Paul speaking, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, mercy means when it's within one power to punish you for what your sin denotes, but it chooses to show you compassion, kindness, and forgiveness instead. That's the word mercy. To offer your bodies, your bodies is your house, or we now call it the temple of God, as a living sacrifice. Since we're in the earth, walking around, functioning, breathing air, you call living. Death, dead, means dysfunctional, not breathing. So that's why we bury a dead, dysfunctional person. It's not living. He did. So he, there's a reason why we get him off the planet. Because you're not operating in life. And you're not operating in a functional way. So what we reason why we bury you because you're in violation of God's law. You can't stay here. We got to dig a ground stick you in it. Why? Because you're dysfunctional. He didn't bring the, come to bring death. He come to bring life. And if you're not operating in life, there's no reason for you to be here. Because you're in violation of the law of living and life. Thus we have to bury you. Get it? Holy, separated, set apart. And pleasing, that means choices, doesn't it? Choices we're making to please God, to honor God, to obey God. That's the word, pleasing to God. That, and he said, this is your true, facts and everything, by example, proper and proper worship. Oh, what? You mean when I do my body being obedient to God and keeping it clean and doing the right thing, it's worship to God? Yes. Now you understand. Now you're starting to see it. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by renewing of your mind. That's called worship. When your mind, remember that's the two areas God look at, mind and heart. When your mind is being transformed into the image of God to think right, to do right, to act right, that's worship to God. Because it's what you're doing in your mind and heart, God is seeing. That's the two areas he looks at. And so he said, he commands us, don't conform to the pattern. Pattern he has to do with a repetitive form you see. A way of acting, a way of thinking, a way of behaving, a way of making choice of the world. Worldliness comes from selfish ambition. But if you mind, that's why I keep saying over and over again, I'm here in church and praying for revival, praying for revival, bad idea. You do not pray for revival. I know it's going to offend some and some may not like it, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Revival is a wrong thing. The Bible don't, don't, don't command you or tell you you should pray for revival. What we should be praying for is what he says here, for transformation. That's biblical. Revival is not. Revival means that you were once alive, as you remember the story, you were once alive, then you went back to die, and so they have to bring the paddler in the hospital. When you have a heart attack, what do they do? They bring the and say, clear, boom, and they revive you. That means that you need a revival, that means you're telling us and you're telling God that you're spiritually dead and you need to be revived. That's why the Bible don't teach that, because once the Spirit of God comes in you, you have life. You're not supposed to go back to death again, unless the only reason why death showed up is because you're walking in unrighteousness and disobedience, and you feel disconnected from God, and you need a reconnection. But what you're seeking after is not revival. You really need transformation of your mind to be renewed, and that will take care of that problem. Because in renewing of your mind, it means you now know how to walk in righteousness and obedience to all of God's commandments. It's called discipline and self-control, and that's why we need revival because we lack that. And then they don't teach you how to walk in righteousness. That's the reason why we think we need revival. 
So we're seeing people operate in the flesh today. We say, oh my God, 2022, don't we need revival for the world? Oh, America's going to hell in the handbasket. Oh, God, send revival. The Lord said, I ain't going to send that. I never told you to pray for revival. I said, pray for transformation though. Be ye transformed by renewing of your mind. Well, the mind cannot be renewed if you keep on getting and digesting the same food or the same information. The only way the mind can be renewed is to change your mind, change your thinking by injecting into your mind a different way of seeing and perceiving what's going on around you. That's called knowledge. In all you're gaining, gain knowledge, gain understanding, gain wisdom, and it leads to transformation. And once you want transformation, transformation by renewing through knowledge of your mind leads to righteousness, obedience, understanding, mystery of God, and to revelation. That's the key. Then, he says, after your mind be renewed, be transformed by renewing your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Hear the word? If you're going to know what God's will is, it doesn't come through revival. It comes through transformation of your mind. Then you'll be able to test, that's discernment, and approve. Approve means to agree what God's will is. Because the purpose of your life is not your own will or your body belongs to God. That's why he says, present your body pleasing to God. Your body does not belong to you. That's his temple. He said, do what pleases him. And then you do what God's will is. What is his will is his good and pleasing and perfect will. So in our prayer time, what we should be seeking in prayer time is not my will. Just as Jesus told you in Matthew chapter 6, but thy will be done in me. What is your perfect, pleasing will that I want to manifest on the earth? See, God can't manifest his will on earth without your help and your yielding your bodies and your mind to him to work his will. Jesus was that example. A man on earth allowing God's perfect will to be done on earth through him. <laughs> Most that are asking for revival in the church because you're not preaching what God, amen. Got it, Jeff. You got that. Exactly. If you understand it's not about revival, you were once dead. When God found you, you were dead spiritually. Then he revived you. But what he put you on the path on after that revival is a path of transformation. Be ye now transformed after bringing back to life. Now live in transformation. And as a result of that, because that's not been taught, people's gone back to death. Can I tell you why? Because they never taught them how to walk in righteousness and obedience to God's commandment. Thus, they're more sin conscious than they are obedient and righteousness conscious. They don't feel worthy. And they don't feel they have the power or the strength to overcome temptation and sin. That's the reason why they've used grace as justification for sin. Versus understand in sin, you don't get grace, you get mercy. Mm. That's the confusion. And that's where people are staying stuck. And you see them, you know, we're not perfect. When you hear that terminology, it's a sign of struggling inside. Why do you have to use the word perfect? Who told you you were perfect? Who told you you had to be perfect? Hmm... The reason that word perfect is used is use an excuse. Well, none of us is perfect. We all have flaws. Now keep that to yourself. If you understand the Bible commanding for one John to walk in light man as Jesus, why aren't you doing it? <laughs> because you don't know how. See, we're taught in church to be religious, not righteous. Righteousness is what we need. Obedience is what we need. Then we need to couple those two with discipline, self-control. You don't need the man. You got the Holy Spirit leading and guiding all truth. Or oh, it's not taught that way. Never be taught that way. Because why? Because then you won't need those individuals who need you captive audience to pick your pocket. Mm, I'm not calling anybody out. I'm just saying. Captive audience can manipulate and control. They believe what they hear without question. And I'm all saying all the time, in everything you hear, question it. It is not true until you discover what they say is true. And you need to ask them a source of where you get the information from. But we don't ask because we just trust what we hear. But they must prove themselves by the word. Prove themselves in scripture. That's why everything I teach you is always scripturally based. You must see it for yourself. I'm giving you scripture. Different way to understand it so you can search it out for yourself. And I challenge you to check out what I say. Just don't take my word. Search it out. Look at it for yourself. And see if you come with the same conclusion. Or I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. So we see in Romans, he tells us, you know what he's looking for? Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is. And the people say, well, how do I know what God's will is? That's a good question, right? What is God's will? Well, can I say it this way? You understand what God's will is? God's will means what is God's purpose and intent. And the best way to know what God's will is to pick up his mind and read it. 
<laughs> now, I just showed you the Bible here. Why did I show you the Bible? Because the Bible is the instruction manual for the believer. So in that manual, the, the, the creator, the manufacturer, didn't want you to guess what was in his mind when he wrote down the laws and why he put them there. He wants you to know what his thought and intent was when he said what he said. Thus, he gave you the his mind, his will, his intent. So when you, something goes wrong in your life, he said, pick up my word, the manual, and find out where the errors happen, place, and adjust yourself to that mind of the creator, and you can adjust yourself. So God gave you his will in his written word. So the idea, I don't know what God's will, it doesn't make sense. If you want to know what's in God's mind, pick up his word and read it. God put his thought, intent, in spoken and written form for you to know what that is, so you don't have to guess. That's why everything in life that is created must come with an instruction manual. They must give you instruction. Why? They want you to know to get the best, the best and the full functionality out of the created product. And by the way, you never go to another product to fix what was created by the manufacturer. He only allowed the authorized dealer, which is the Holy Spirit, to help you. But when we go to another product to fix another product, you usually don't turn out too well. <laughs> We're supposed to go back to the manufacturer. That's where they give you warranties and guarantees. I'm just saying. My God. Because why? The reason why the manufacturer gives you warranties and guarantees is because his name is on his product and his name is on the line. So he can't afford to allow the product to fail because if the product fails, his name fails. Thus you see Sony and you see the, the car dealership. When anything goes wrong with one of their created product, what's the first thing they do? They have something called a recall. Now, they, they spend billions to put it out there, but they'll spend billions to fix the problem because my reputation, my name's online. The moment I get a reputation as being a bad vehicle or a car or whatever I create, then my name will become mud and people won't trust me anymore. Thus, you're going to understand the mind and the heart of God, why he sends the Holy Spirit as the only authorized one to lead you and guide you in all truth. So the product will live up to its expectation and you become everything the manufacturer designed you to become. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Let's go on. So he tells the woman. Uh, we did this one already, but let me go on beyond there. Okay, let's move on. So we're now looking at our obedience is our obedience is true worship to God. I'm sorry, I need to go back up one more verse before that. I have one Samuel 15, 22 before I get to there. 1 Samuel 15, 22. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offering and sacrifice as much as obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. What's he trying to tell you here? Does the God delight in our offering and sacrifice? What are people offering today to God? Sacrifice? Offerings? Hmm. As much as obeying the Lord? In other words, in our offering of sacrifice, if we sacrifice something for God, it's a sign we ain't walking right. We're trying to buy God off. Oh, we don't say it that way. We want it to hurt us. And God will really see my sorrow or my grief because of what I did. So I'm going to sacrifice for my, to him to let him know I'm serious. I'm really repenting. So I need to offer sacrifice to him. He said, what are you doing that for? Why do I need to offer sacrifice? And I love what the Lord said in the book of Psalms. If I wanted rams and gold, I can, the earth is mine. I can cook my own. I don't need yours. Your offering and sacrifice is a stench in my mouth. So stop it. <laughs> obey me. If you obey me, you have to offer me no sacrifice. I'm good. Listen, I own everything. So give me another room or another ram or goat or sheep. Keep that to yourself. He says to us, your burnt offering and sacrifice as he said, it does nothing for me. He's not delighted to the Lord. He does not delight in it. He wants your obedience. To obey is better than your sacrifice. Mm. Let's be honest about one thing. Isn't it true? And I said to, uh, speaking to my friend Jeff and um, Ruben this week, I said, what was the two things that you wanted to do and you desired when you came from the world and come to your faith in God? What's the two things you were desiring? Wasn't it to learn how to walk right and obey God? To walk right and obey God, right? That's what he's saying here. To walk right and obey God. Obedience. Question, have you been taught how to do that yet? In all the time we've been serving the Lord. Have they taught you how to walk in righteousness? Not tell you you should. Not said the Bible says. Not say you should pray and read the word. Have they taught you in practical step by step how to walk right? 
Have they taught you what the beatings look like? Guaranteed they have not. That's the reason for my teaching on this. I wonder if you keep on emphasizing the word righteousness. Because the covenant of the instruction man is built on the word righteousness. All the laws of God is summed up in righteousness. And so when we learn to walk in righteousness, you can claim the promise and the covenant. But most don't know how to walk right. And they walk around with a sin consciousness and a guilt. And as a result of it, don't feel worthy enough to seek God's perfect will in anything. They ask what they ask to miss because they don't have the wrong, they have the wrong concept. They ask, but they don't believe they're going to get it because I'm not worthy. That's the reason why people are always praying for each other. Sister, pray for me. I want you to pray for me. Why would they pray for you? I would say it over and over again. Who can pray for you better than you can? Why do you need me to pray for you? Can I tell you why they want you to pray for them? Because they don't feel worthy enough that God will hear them, but God will hear you, Brother Gary. You know, you seem to be blessed and anointed. God will hear you. But if you pray for me, I know God will answer you. Oh, so you're going through a proxy to get something from God. Why you go through a proxy? I thought your relationship was personal. I thought your relationship was personal with God. Well, you need me. Who can talk to God better for yourself than you? He wants to hear from you. He says relationship with him. He said, come up and talk to me. But we don't go before God and talk to him because we don't feel worthy. Because we know deep down in our mind and our heart, there's some buried issue. Isn't that true? Hmm. That's the word discernment comes into play. If we deal with the issue of the mind and the heart, you can go before God in boldness. Boldness and confidence doesn't come out of disobedience. It comes out of obedience. When you obey God, you feel confident towards him. When you disobey, you don't feel worthy. So we have to fix that by learning how to walk in righteousness. Walk in according to the covenant of God. And I do many teaching righteousness for you to understand so you can go back and listen to those. But Samuel tells you, God prefer obedience above sacrifice. And to heed or to obey is better than the fat of ram. So all the sacrifice we offer to God doesn't impress him. He said, I want your mind and your heart to be right. Renew and transform your mind. Make conscious choice to obey me. You don't have to yield to sin like the world tells you or religion tells you. You can discern and determine that just that today I choose to obey God. Holy Spirit, your job is to help me to overcome my weakness. To point out any area of flaw and give me the power, enable and strength to say no to that and say yes to God. It is not taught, but it is possible. It's available to you. You don't have to violate God's law. You can walk in righteousness like he told you. If he just tells you without giving the power, he'd be playing with your head. He didn't do that. He made sure if he tells you to walk right, he gave you the means to walk right. Thus the word grace comes into play. He gave you that to give you the power, the enablement, and strength you needed to overcome, which the children of Israel didn't have. So our obedience is true worship to God. Your obedience is true worship. If you can't say the word, and you can't sing the song because something's wrong with your voice, or you can't move the body because you have paralysis, can you still worship God in spirit and in truth? Yes, because it's not a matter of the words or the action. It's a matter of the obedience. That's worship to God in spirit and in truth. That's the obedience part. Wow. Revelation 4, verse 8 through 11. Revelation 4, verse 8 through 11. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under, the, under its wings. Wings, I'm sorry. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creature gave glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell down before him, who sits on the throne, who sits on the throne, not on the platform, not behind the podium, who sits on the throne, and worship him who lives forever and ever. They laid their crown before the throne. Interesting, not church, not religion. Because I'm, I'm emphasizing these points because I need you to see our concept is what's hurting us. If our concept of God is a religious God, then he wouldn't have a throne. He'll have a platform, a seat on the platform. He'll have the denomination, whatever words we use. But you're not seeing that here. Everything about the throne and God is about the throne. Only kings sit on throne, not a religion or a preacher. Okay? So they lay their crown before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord and God. To receive glory, there's the word again, and honor and power. You were created, you, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Hey, from, hey, hey, Ruthie, welcome aboard. So as a result of it, you understand this is kingly talk, this king concept of the Bible is what makes the Bible make sense to you when you start to understand. You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you have created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You know the scripture, Isaiah 29, 13. Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord says, these people come near me with their mouth. Uh-oh. 
and honor me with their lips. Uh-oh. But their hearts, there's it is again, are far from me. They're saying all the right things. They're offering the sacrifice and go. They're doing it. And they're saying all the right things. However, he don't care about the outer. He cares about the inner. But their hearts are far from me. They worship. Listen to this. Most of our worship has been done this way. We don't realize we did it, but we've done it. Because we never asked God what he calls worship. We just go to the man and trust him. Their, their worship of me is based on merely human rules. They have been taught. Mm. It is not from God the way we worship many times, but basically human tradition or rules is what they're using as worship of God. So they're saying the right things, but their heart and minds are not in it. It is not in truth. It's not in spirit. It's based, in, it's based on a mere tradition of men. Oh, God, is that in there? The worship method and program we have been practicing is based on human rules that they taught us not what the scripture says, nor what God asks or considers to be worship. Let me say it again. The worship method and the program we have been practicing is based on human rules, human tradition that they taught us. Not on what the scripture says. I told you what God says. What he seeks after is true worshipers in spirit and in truth. But you've never heard that. It's based on human tradition. Certain patterns we've been practicing. And while in itself the practice is not bad, it's just the fact it's not based on truth. On the words that we use. And the worth we attribute to the word worship. And so God's trying to get that right. Worship, God, comes out of obedience it comes from spirit and it comes from truth. And thus we can say all the right words. We can put up the right action. Amen. God is good. We can do all the rituals. But he said, I'm looking at the heart and the mind. Ha. Huh. And based on the worship I've been getting thus far, that it said, I'm building my throne on, is based on merely human rules or tradition that they have been taught, which get passed on. And we call it worship. <laughs> Thus, many times we come out of worship and nothing change. We go into worship and nothing change. Thus, we hear a lot of noise, it stirs the flesh, but what really change? Hmm, interesting. Just a question. Give you another scripture. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, 29. Hebrews 12, 28, 29. Therefore, since we have received a, his word. Mm -hmm. well, mark this, please. Underline this. Everything I'm telling you, you have thrown, decrees, laws, you've seen all happen here. Now, let's see what Hebrew tells it. Therefore, since we have received what? Not a gospel, a kingdom. Hmm, underline that, please, in your Bible. Highlight this particular verse. Therefore, since we have received, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and with, there's a word again, Oh, <laughs> reverence has to do with respect and honor. All has to do with, with an awestruck. You know, you get awestruck by something or someone. There's no words to use. You just, uh, wow. And you just stuck at the wow. There's no word to describe. Verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. That's Hebrew 12, 28 through 29. Let us the key to worship. And since we receive the kingdom, is to be thankful. God loves an attitude of gratitude. Thankfulness draws God's presence. Murmuring, complaining pushes him away. The children of Israel being delivered by a mighty hand, seeing, I was talking about this past week to someone, seeing a pillar of a cloud by day and fire by night that kept them warm. And yet every chance they get to complain, they murmuring, complain, was not thankful. And thus God had to destroy them. Unthankfulness, complaining and murmuring, it pushes people away, but also does not draw God's presence. No one wants to be around somebody who is miserable, weeny whiny, and complaining. <laughs> so over and over again, people want to be around people who's joyful, happy, and thankful. So I'm learning this principle of being thankful in everything. In everything, the Bible says, give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. 
So your circumstance may not be all going the way you want to, but there's something in it to give thanks for. And for no other reason, in thankfulness, and the problems occurring, you can give God thanks for the outcome, for the lesson you learned, and for the, the things you're going through that you know there is going to come an end, and thus trouble don't last always. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So give thanks for the morning. Find some reason to be thankful. Thankfulness is the key, and the key to accessing the things of God. That's why he loves an attitude of gratitude. Love what Jesus always does. In every situation he came across, he always gave the Father thanks. When he was in wilderness with the 15,000 people to feed, men, women, children, he just lifted up the two fish father, and he gave thanks. So you're going to see it over and over again repeated. Thankfulness is very important. And so the worship God accepted with reverence and awe for our God's consuming fire. So worship to God is thankfulness, reverence, and awe. Let me say it again. So worship to God is thankfulness, reverence, and awe of God. Hmm. Give me another scripture. Psalms 100. Wow, we're making good time. Growing in all real nice. Shout for joy. So shout has to do with praise, right? Psalm 100 says, shout for joy. All the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Well, hmm. Worship the Lord gladness, right? So we shout, you know, that's the sound of the mouth, remembering words or sound, right? Worship the Lord with gladness. Well, gladness is an emotion that cannot be expressed by word, but it can be expressed by our emotion, our movement, or the laughter or joy on our face, right? That's what it can be seen. Come before him with joyful song or with singing. Know ye the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. He said, now, be, we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Now enter, my mom loves this one, enter his gate with thanksgiving. And into his, his word, courts, not church, <laughs> not building, enter his courts with praise. Praise means shout thankfulness. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generation. So worship here, in this particular chapter, represent is joy, gladness, thanksgiving, and praise. So I'm showing you a different form of what worship would mean based on what you're reading if you start to define those terms. So worship would be joy. Joy is not happiness, by the way. So if, you have, if you're happy, happiness is based on your other circumstance. If things are going my way, I'm broke, I find $5, I'm going to be happy because I need $5 to buy me some food. You're happy. But after you spend the $5, you can go back to being not so happy anymore. Joy now comes from a deeper place. Joy now is based on the inner understanding and knowledge of the heart and the mind that it does not matter what my other circumstance look like. I am at peace with God and just like I have joy inside even though the storm rage on the outside. So... My outer circumstances doesn't affect my joy. It'll affect my happiness, but not my joy, because my joy comes from a deeper place of my relationship with God that isn't affected by my outer circumstances. You get it? So in the midst of craziness, you can be thankful and be at peace while everybody's running around with their, like a chicken with their head cut off, because why? You have joy. Hmm. And the Bible tells you the joy of the Lord is what? Your strength. <laughs> I'm the same. So joy is not the same as happiness. I just want you to know that. So worship in Psalm 100 is, doing, is joy, gladness, thanksgiving, and praise. Give me one more. Ooh. Revelation 14, 7. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's Revelation 14, 7. And now it leads us into, oh, I'm running out of time here, verses about the kingdom of God and the worship we'll be practicing forever. Just give you a couple of verses here. I'll see how far I can get. I'm going to end this session here tonight. Um, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Mm, wrongdoers, evildoer, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, 
nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Very interesting word. In saying inherit religion, it says God's kingdom. Why is that inherited God's kingdom? Because the kingdom of God will not be will not come because people say they're in God's kingdom. The kingdom of God must be revealed by the Spirit of God. Thus, many people think they're safe with God. I love what he tells one of the Pharisees, Jesus, came to him by night, and he asked him a question, teacher, which is greatest commandment, he tells what it was, fear Israel, the Lord that God is one Lord, he says, well, you've answered well. And he says to the Pharisee, and he says, you, you are not far from the kingdom. In other words, you ain't in religion, but you're not in yet, bro, but you're close. <laughs> Wow. So in other words, the reason why the Bible still says clearly that these individuals shall not inherit the kingdom is because the kingdom has got to be revealed by God to those who he has initially predestined to enter it. It is offered to all, but the revelation must come by the Spirit for them to our eyes to be opened to see the kingdom of God. Thus, many may be in a church, religion, or some form of worship of God, but they're not in God's kingdom. Just as Nicodemus was in religion, Judaism, taught the Torah, taught the Bible, had students, had disciples. But when he came to Jesus by night, said, what must I do to enter? He had all of the credentials. He had all of what man required. Yet God, Jesus said, hmm, sorry, you're not in. In order to enter, he said, since you came to me privately, you're the only one who came. Let me tell you, give you the secret to get in, enter. You must become a child again. You got to be born again, sir. Sorry I need to tell you that. He said, what? Born again. I thought I'm good. I'm in God's kingdom. I'm teaching the Torah. I'm going to read the Bible. I read the Torah. I'm good. He said, ah. You must become a child again. In other words, the concept there was you got to drop your pre-training condition programming, your your religious understanding, humble yourself, become like a child, and then I'll instruct you and renew and transform your mind again into childlike faith to step in the kingdom living. So I teach you the proper way to become a citizen of the kingdom. You're now in religion, but you're not in my kingdom. That's the reason why I'm trying to tell you. Many people who was using the word, we're funding God's kingdom. You're a part of God's kingdom. Sorry, that's not how it's done. You can claim the name all you want to without understanding what a kingdom is. You just use it as a form of word, but you have no concept what it means. If a man uses the word kingdom and can't define it for me, what it means to be in the kingdom, then they're not in it. Sorry. I know people say, well, Gary, that's kind of harsh. No, you need to understand the kingdom only comes by revelation. That's how it comes. Now, it's been offered to all to enter into kingdom, but many will reject it because it's going to be different than what they've heard. And they can't change their programming or their indoctrination, so they'll reject it. And then Jesus tells you, the one thing that delays me from coming, because I want to give every man a second chance to get it right or get it right with me, is Matthew twenty four fourteen. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all nations, so that each one have a chance to enter, and then the end comes. And until this message gets out there to all. Now, many who are in, who are the first, are rejecting. Many who are in the religious system are rejecting it. They're just using words in passing, and by attaching it to their ministry, the kingdom ministry. Well, ain't that special? What does that mean? <laughs> Do you have any concept of what the kingdom is? And the reason I kept emphasizing to you tonight, all these kingdom terminology, courts, decrees, laws, edicts, and thrones, and scepters of righteousness, and king. The reason I keep emphasizing the word is because our concept of the Bible is error. And because we've been taught error, we have to become like children again to renew our mind to accept the kingdom concept. But that means laying down what we've been programmed to believe. We have our mind needs to be transformed by injecting new way of perceiving scripture. That's the reason for my teaching. I'm teaching you that I, like many of you, have been in the religious system for 40 years. I heard all the teaching. I've been behind the scene to see what happens. And when the Holy Spirit came to me with this message, I had to drop everything I had learned and knew and start to research for myself the questions that never got answered when I was in the system. And when I started to realize what we we're being taught are not necessarily biblical enough for the Bible made no sense. I had to drop what I had learned and be trained again by the Holy Spirit. And so he sat me down to instruct me in the ways of God. So the same thing has to happen for all of us. That's how you enter the kingdom. So when he says here, do you not know? Do not be deceived. Neither these individuals shall enter in the kingdom because kingdom will only come to those God has has put his mark upon, put his seal upon, and said, you belong to me. Hmm. And he said, I'll declare my father, that one is mine. So he put a mark upon your seal and brought you to the kingdom of living. But many will hear this and will reject it. Okay? 
They're in religion, but they're not in his kingdom. Sorry to say. Matthew 6, 33, he said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you and as you to you as well. If you seek first supplies, need in the kingdom of God, come through seeking the kingdom. Very interesting word. Mm, very interesting word, seeking the kingdom. What, what's in the kingdom you're seeking? Well, you're seeking favor with the king. Right? That's the whole idea of kingdom. You're seeking favor with the king. Because at the center of the kingdom is the king. And he sits on the throne. And he has accepted the righteousness. And he rule on your behalf. Once you found favor with him, he will give you his ring or his seal. That what they would do for him when you go and he's not there. And he give his ring. They'll do for him. They'll do for you. That's called favor. And so he said, if you want stuff from the kingdom, seek first the kingdom. Seek the God of the kingdom. Walk in righteousness. And there's the key word that most keep on walking over. Righteousness is the key in the kingdom living. Why? Because all the covenants and promises of the king is based on that word righteousness. Being right stand with God. No guilt or condemnation of heart and mind. That's the word. And if you walk right and seek the kingdom, then all the stuff you need shall be added. You don't have to ask for it. God will give it to you because you're his children. Give you another one. Matthew 19, 14. Your, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Did you see it there? Did you hear that terminology? I need to show you something you don't see. To show you that we are just stewards of everything belong to God. This is what it says again. Matthew 19, 14. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and in earth is yours. That's the words of king. Everything under the kingdom, the meaning of the king personally belongs to the king. That's the rules of kingdoms. It says, yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as the head over all. So if you understand the concept, the earth is the Lord, the heavens, and the fullness thereof. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, the cattle of a thousand hills belongs to me. So, simple question. Then if the Lord owns everything, what does he need your ten bucks on Sunday morning for? If he owns it all. Do you understand you as a steward of what he gave you, the power, strength, and ability to go out, go out and earn a living? So why does he need 10% of your stuff? Because we may have a misconception. The 10% that we talk about should be set aside for you in your storehouse. But well, that's another story. That's a whole other teaching. Okay? But the idea, everything on the earth belongs to the Lord. We're just managers over what God gave us to rule over. Your ability and talent came from God. Your gifting came from God. Your purpose came from God. Your identity came from God. How dare us claim ownership? I, 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 I. Uh-uh. Well, the only I you heard in your Bible is when the devil came and said, I will build it, and I will this exalt my throne, and I. What happened to him? He still in hell, the H-E double hockey stick, I'm just saying. But the idea that I means I did it myself. No, 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 no. Everything on the earth, under the earth, in heaven, and on there, and the universe belongs to the Lord. All right? We need to settle that. My time has come to an end. I got to end here. There's a lot more scripture. Give me one more, and I'll call it here. Whoa. First Chronicles 29, 11. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. I'm done here. I'm done. I'm not going any further. <laughs> Do not be afraid, little flock. Interesting little flock. Children, right? For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Oh, there's so much more scripture I can give you pertaining to that. To prove to you the mess of the Bible is about a kingdom and a king. And that you're sons of the king. And that's why he rules the king of kings and lord of lords. That the king of kings, lord of lords, talks about is you and me. When you understand who you are, who you are birthed from, your identity, your purpose, and your destiny. My God, you have no understanding how great you really are in the eyes of God. God bless you all. We love you. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. I'm starting a new series on who were Jesus' disciples. I'm going to give you a breakdown of them to understand who Jesus picked, who they were, and what did they do, and how did they function. I'm going to answer some questions for you pertaining to his disciples. So when you see them, you're going to see again, a king come to earth, didn't go to religion, get his disciples, went to the world. We will talk about that. He got some citizens. Well, God bless you all. We love you and look forward to seeing you again next week as we know that coming expect another great time in kingdom, knowledge, wisdom, understanding. We love you all. God bless you. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye now.